Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Priya Karan. I'm a newest member with Mosaic Data Science. And um, I actually landed this opportunity by attending one of these sessions, um, probably on the last day of my previous job. And uh, I saw a posting from Drew and hopped right onto it. And here I am today, <laughs> uh, presenting in one of these. So it's a good feeling to be here. Um, so. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so today, um, I, have, uh, I have two things that I'm going to touch upon. Uh, one of it is um, my um, journey into data science. And another one is I'm going to share um, a computer vision use case, uh, which we have implemented for, um, for uh, airport layout detection. So um, a little bit of background. Actually, you don't have a slide uh, for that, but um, I'm a petroleum engineer. I graduated from UFA in 2015, um, just around the time of the downturn of the oil where all the jobs were gone. And <laughs> um, so that's when I got lucky to get a position with uh, in a um, graduate engineering development program uh, with General Electric. and I. Uh, hopped on that and uh, um, was very lucky to uh, get into uh, teams which worked on oil and gas analytics. Um, so using my domain knowledge in the area and also gathering some new skill sets, um, I was able to navigate my career in this path. Um, I also got an opportunity to work um, in a computer vision team which worked on um, integrating some um, images from scanners um, and building some um, models for identifying tumors, lesions. So uh, that got me uh, skilled in the area of computer vision. So um, um, why I chose to talk about a little bit on journey of data science is because um, I actually went through this transition by do doing some of the online courses um, to get some of the skills. So one thing I would like to emphasize on is that um, the journey into data science is, um, is not a short path. Um, it's an ever-changing landscape. So um, no, you can't be learning one set of uh, toolkit and be like, OK, I'm done. So uh, one thing that I've actually noticed is that you are always putting in 8 to 10 hours of your effort, which is outside of your regular work hours uh, to just keep updated on what kind of uh, models are coming out in the research environment. Um, what can I learn new? Uh, what are the new libraries which is out there which is going to make my job easy? So uh, these are the things which you have to be uh, constantly thinking about to um, keep yourself right up in the game. Otherwise, you're just going to be uh, dragging behind as um, the technology is maturing. So. Um, that's one very important aspect. So one more thing um, in uh, becoming a data scientist is, um, I know um, uh, Chris and Sean talked about um, empathy and uh, uh, some of the skills that um, kind of decide where your career growth is. So what I wanted to just um, kind of lay out here is there are multiple different skills that come into being a data scientist. So um, when you're targeting to become a data scientist. There are, um, there are all these different tools, which is very important for you to know. So, and uh, you need to be good at math, linear algebra, statistics, programming, machine learning, um, handling data, cleaning up data. So uh, where does it stop? So, um, so that's, that's very dependent on the kind of organization that you're working with. Um, so uh, in my experience um, on, uh, working for General Electric. Um, it was a very big organization. There were different teams for doing different tasks. So there's a data team which handles the data lake. Then there's an analytics team which is only doing analytics. Uh, there's a software team where you hand over um, your algorithms and someone else take care, takes care of your problem. So, um, so that's when you, you have to decide what kind of a data scientist you want to become. So in these large organizations, you have a chance to go deep in your domain and 
get those very specific skills that you want to master in and um, become an expert there. Um, otherwise, uh, there are consultancies, um, smaller organizations, smaller startups, which uh, don't have the liberty to have wide range of teams to do that. And you end up gaining a lot of skills because um, you're kind of uh, hands tied up over there and you have to pick up everything very quick and uh, show that in your product and your results. So um, that's one of the main distinction on how you want to define yourself as a data scientist. And uh, um, that's where you start to tick off some of those skills and see where you want to be placed. Um, this is just uh, a small um, um, path to the skills and tool sets that I found online, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, um, I think a lot of it is not visible, unfortunately. But OK, perfect. Um, so there's some fundamentals um, in statistics. Then you move into machine learning path. Um, there's some in programming. There's some in big data. Um, there's some of the toolkits uh, like Python, R, Spark, Apache. Um, some on visualization, some on data ingestion pipeline. Um, here, there are some more on machine learning, getting deeper into it. And then there's text analytics. There's also something missing on computer vision. So um, again, uh, going back to the same question, um, how many of these skills do you want to learn? How many you want to gain expertise in? And where do you want to specialize? Um, at least you have to know 70 to 80% of it. Um, even if not be an expert, but at least have working knowledge of it is what I think is um, necessary. Um, I've just listed some of the courses which are available online. Uh, just because I went through a similar training, I didn't. I'm not. Um, I'm, I'm not a data scientist by education. I'm, an, I'm a data scientist by experience, and uh, most of my skills acquired is by um, using some of the data which is within the organization. Um, and uh, uh, applying some of the models that I learned online and seeing how it translates um, in solving a problem. So uh, that is my path on um, learning to become a data scientist. So one of the examples um, that I can give in this area is uh, I was working for um, an oil and gas analytics team, and uh, we were looking at flow estimation in a pool level um, and trying to back allocate um, and find values how much your individual wells is producing based on your uh, final value. So I entered this team in uh, almost to the end, end stage of deployment where they were ready to wrap it up and put it in an application. So um, back in the days, most of the engineering programs, I think even now, is still in MATLAB. So when I got into the team, I was still learning Python, and uh, I thought that was the right thing to get on. I translated most of the codes from MATLAB to Python. And that's how I think I learned most of my Python skills. Um, it kind of speeded up the process on how easily hands-on I could be uh, with some of these skills. And also, uh, one, uh, one thing that I want to point out to most of them who are in this journey of transition, uh, being engineers or getting into roles in analytics, is that um, you have access to a lot of real world data, which people outside who are still trying to become data scientists don't have. So it's probably the right time to make use of this data and just to play around, visualize, see what you can do with it. Um, so your, your learning path is much, much faster than you would hope for. So um, well, this is pretty much what I have on the first topic. Um, I'm going to share. One of the use cases that I have on computer vision. So um, the problem that we were trying to solve is um, we have these um, airports, um, airport layouts in the aviation industry, uh, which are actually it's easier to talk with a picture. So. Um, these are what pictures from airports look like, and we have some of the blueprints from these airports. So what we're trying to determine is, um, can we locate where the runways are as it's there in these blueprints? Um, there are other um, elements like 
There are some buildings. These are the taxiways in which the airport, um, the, the flights take the route. Uh, there's uh, some of the landing area near the gates, uh, some buildings. So the end target of this problem was for a proposal for FAA who wanted to identify um, all these elements automatically. Um, most of these are drawn um, when, uh, either when the airports were constructed. So there's a lot of changes going through over the years and they wanna keep a record on what's up there. So um, this was a use case that we were trying to solve. Um, talking a little bit about my data set that I've used for solving this problem. Um, there are about uh, 46 airports that I had data for, um, um, with the ground truth, of course. So, um, and they cover uh, some in the US and a few in Canada. So, um, for, for the purpose of generating the ground truth, um, we used uh, uh, Google Pro, uh, uh, Google Earth Pro. So, okay. Um, so this is uh, one of the airports, um, and we try to extract uh, just these specific um, areas which were part of the runways. Um, so uh, a major problem with uh, this particular class that we were looking at is they look very, very similar to the um, highways which are running across there. Um, there are also these taxiways um, which might look very similar to the runways. So um, our problem was to distinguish this and just be able to identify which one is the runway. So runways have these small elements um, in the end called blast paths. And also, uh, if I actually really zoom into it, there are uh, thick white lines along the, um, along the runway and some numbers on it, um, which are able to identify if you have a very high resolution of image. So uh, that again increases the computation that you would put in into the problem. So um, uh, can we do it with least computation and still be able to identify all the runways that is there? start with, as I showed from the Google Earth um, Pro, um, we extracted these uh, screenshot which were about 700 by 700 resolutions. Um, the ground truth images that was captured from there uh, kind of looked like this. Um, and then it was converted to a binary image to look like this and then filled in some polygons and cleaned up um, to have ground truth images uh, looking like this. I have some, um, some code uh, which is kind of not sure if it's relevant to everybody, but um, I'm just going to quickly hop through just to get an idea of kind of libraries that go into it and uh, um, things like that. So uh, what I'm doing uh, in my code is pretty much um, use OpenCV for most of the image processing element of, uh, um, of it. Um, so here I read my image and then um, so there were some edge borders um, located in the image, which I'm trying to clean out. Uh, in some of the images, I have some traces of the Google logo, which I want to remove it. And then I converted it into a binary image. And, um, and then um, have another code, which is kind of like um, converting uh, those um, outer boundary lines to a filled polygon. So uh, there what I'm doing is just um, extracting the outer contour of those lines and then filling it um, again with OpenCV. Um, so this is what I was talking about. I'm trying to remove these um, outer rectangles. Uh, some of them have some Google logos on here. I'm trying to eliminate that. And then I have this, um, I use contour finding to get to this. All right. um, when I do try to find the contours, um, I end up with, because uh, I'm actually just trying to find a con contour of an outer boundary, um, I end up with some images resulting like this because it's trying to capture most of the outer boundaries. So for the runways which are clearly separated, it does a very good job at that. 
But for those which are um, interlinking, then I have to uh, come to uh, clearing that. And um, I do that by using a software called ImageJ, um, which helps in a little bit of image processing. Um, I also do some, uh, since I already mentioned, I had only 46 airports for my analysis. Um, so had to enhance my data set. Uh, so I use a lot of augmentations, uh, some channel shuff shuffling, some hue saturation changes. I flip them, um, do a couple of transformations. So one image can look like multiple of them. Um, I test some of those to see how uh, it looks like I actually use a library called Albumentation to do that. It's actually uh, a very cool library I found online. So, so with just a few lines of code, you're able to see how your um, images look like with this particular library. And, um, and then you decide which of these is more relevant for your problem and try to apply just those to um, the augmentations. Keras also has inbuilt uh, data generator which uh, can produce your augmentations automatically. Um, that's also a solution, but I wanted to get a visual on how it actually looks like, um, which is kind of limited when you uh, try to fit it with your model fit um, in your uh, Keras. Um, so, Going back. Okay. Um, so to solve this problem, I used an architecture called UNET. Um, so uh, it, it composes of uh, some of convolutional layers. Um, and uh, so there's a downslam sampling of the image. So you feed in your image and your mask um, at this end and it gets downsampled to uh, um, a feature space, and then it gets upsampled. The cool thing about it is there are some skip, skip connections in this network which helps to pass information at um, higher resolution and um, help in better generating these in your unit. So um, it's, it's a very highly used network in biomedical space for um, um, tumor segmentations and um, such applications. Um, I actually uh, came, up, came across some of the use cases that were used in, in one of the Kaggle competitions for satellite imagery, and it, uh, and it was supposed to work really well on them. So I uh, decided to test on it. And uh, I modified this network uh, by adding a few layers for uh, reducing the overfitting on the model. Um, So here is some of my results from, um, so this is the ground truth mask. Uh, this is what my model predicted uh, for those airports. So there's some over prediction on some areas, uh, but it's fairly doing a good job. This was a prototype model, so it's yet to go through some refinement, but um, we saw that it did a great job at almost uh, a few first iterations. Um, there were also some bad results which I wanted to show. Um, so some of them, like this, um, since, the, uh, since I didn't have such kind of data in my uh, training set, um, I didn't even recognize anything in these images. Um, again, there are some which are, uh, so the major problem that I mentioned, you want to avoid uh, selection of the roads and the taxiways. So here's an example where everything's getting picked up. Um, some of them are doing well. One of the runways is selected, but the other one's kind of missing. Um, in a way, it's kind of hard for me also to kind of recognize and say, okay, this is a runway. So um, I wouldn't suspect if the computer vision model didn't do so well in this case, but, um, but it's still a work in progress and uh, we see quite some potential in improving them once it goes through uh, to a full-fledged project where we want to develop more than um, more than just the runways and uh, get to all other elements like buildings. And so these, uh, these, these were some of the airports which were randomly selected um, out in the world. Uh, so not specific to any of the data that was there in our training or test set. And we wanted to see how the model's performing in 
a very random set of images that was uh, pulled out, and it actually did a great job. So um, it was a good attempt to uh, first PLC. Um, all right, yeah, that's everything I have. So questions? <laughs> was again dice, one minus dice. Yeah. Um, it actually tends to do better. I also tried, uh, my metric is dice, my loss function is one minus dice. I think one minus dice, I'm not sure, but. Uh, no, yeah, custom loss function, yeah. yeah. Uh, about 500 images. Um, it trained within 60, 70 epochs. So time yeah, not so much. And also one thing to note is that I used um, Google Collab to do this. So anybody who is trying their hands into uh, computer vision and don't have access to GPU, uh, it's a great platform to start your learning process there because um, you can run your Keras TensorFlow models, most of them are um, already pre-installed, so you don't even have to set up your environment and everything. So you just go import, and then you can just like try anything that's out there um, and start working on your skills. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Um, why did you choose the UNEX model architecture instead of something else outside the medical field? Um, mainly because I saw the success of it for uh, the satellite imagery in some of the material that I read online and one of the Kaggle competitions, which was among the top in the board, kind of had uh, very good um, segmentations of not just one class, but like buildings, crops, trees, uh, waterways, and uh, multiple of them. And uh, UNIT was able to uh, segment them very, very effectively. So that was the reason why I picked uh, that as my first model and it happened to work so well. <laughs> Um, it's not specifically one loss function that I try. I try a bunch of them and see the efficiency of it on how the model trains, whether it converges faster. So mainly using one minus, one minus of dice is because my, my convergence um, and seeing a, a model implement was much faster in my training. So uh, through multiple iterations, I kind of decided on that, yeah. Yeah. How many hours? Um, yeah, I think, yeah, four weeks total, including data processing and everything. Yeah. Was your entire use case done in Jupyter with uh, Python? And if you were going to present, what would you do? Um, I, I did some of the ana analysis with Jupyter Notebook just because uh, you're able to visualize the images much better. Um, when I'm doing a bulk of images that I want to see, I usually switch to PyCharm because that's my go-to tool. And uh, I, I was sticking to Jupyter just because of the Collab uh, notebook, which is still, again, Jupyter. Uh, so it was easier for me to translate between them. Yeah. And uh, it is still easier to um, show the model functionalities uh, if they're interested in seeing what kind of architecture is used and everything. It's easier to show it uh, with the Jupyter Notebook, but um, if you're showing it to someone in an executive level, I would say pull them all into a slides and just show what they can understand. Uh, pictures speak the best, so uh, results with pictures probably is the best uh, solution for that. Relevant to them, not relevant to us. 
Uh, I'm an individual contributor for this project. <laughs> lab gave you the algorithms yeah. and you were translating. Yeah. At what point did you start working out algorithms of your own and having, how do you go about learning your algorithms? Uh, so, Where are you pulling from? Okay. Um, so um, I was actually working on a very uh, complicated um, engineering model, uh, which was uh, doing some of the nodal analysis um, calculations, uh, which was uh, mostly on engineering principles, and then that feeds into uh, some of the data that comes in from different sources and uh, goes into a Kalman filter statistical model. So um, though the algorithm is there, um, there are not indications on what libraries work best for these kind of analysis, um, whether using something like pandas to structure this data into the matrix um, as it feeds into the Kalman filter. Um, is, is that a better way to go or use uh, NumPy arrays to do that? So these are the decisions that you tend to take on the path of learning whether what works and what not. So I wouldn't say just by translating somebody else's code is going to help, but um, where can you put in your own expertise there or your learnings from what you're doing online uh, can be translated into any of the work that you get through the organization. So this was just the first step. And then I got into the computer vision lab where I was writing algorithms for deep learning. So um, to get there without having um, um, my hands around how I can read an image, create them into an array, it's not possible. So um, you need to learn your way around your code and be proficient on your language, then um, sky's the limit. <laughs> Sorry? I haven't tried them on this as uh, it was still a POC. So the next stage, uh, I have thoughts on a couple of different models that I want to try where I'm able to extract more than just runways at one go. So multi-class uh, segmentations all at once. So uh, that's uh, still on the way to go. <laughs> Okay. And follow those courses instead of just looking to computer science because I see, I see that's a very broad field. Yeah. You don't need to look into NLP or computer vision. Or yeah. So, um, so I know that there are a bunch of different courses for uh, data sciences and it's really overwhelming. So I would start with getting a handle on um, Python or R, uh, one of it, um, and be very proficient with it and start to learn some of the machine learning techniques, um, more on the level of getting an understanding of how a model works, uh, what is the math behind it, um, what do the numbers of the results represent, so start there. Uh, I know a lot of, lot of courses give you that information, but um, there are still uh, portals like Medium or um, uh, data toward data sciences where people have reviewed a lot of these courses and kind of recommended what's best in terms of what, uh, which is rated uh, for having the best um, capstone projects. So um, you probably, uh, it's a good idea to start um, going down that path and seeing which is the most relevant for you. And also the first slide that I shared before as to what kind of data scientist that you want to become. So are you interested in just like uh, doing some data management or doing data engineering or um, getting into machine learning models. So um, if you start building expertise in one of these areas and then build from there. Uh, one more thing is, uh, of course, these, uh, these meetups have been really, really helpful for me uh, when I was transi transitioning from one job to the other. Um, I met some great people who wanted to um, do some pet projects together. Uh, there are also uh, some groups like Data for Good, which kind of like gives you data and you can build your model uh, for free, but you're getting hands-on experience with real data. So those are some things that you can do if you're um, not lucky enough to get started in an organization directly or offer to do something for free uh, for anybody in the university or, you know, uh, so that's the first step. Yeah. 
must stumble across stuff that might be similar? Like, do you have to force yourself to kind of do it from scratch, or you take pieces of other people? Like, how does that process work? So um, normally, uh, so suppose I'm solving a segmentation problem. So there are a bunch of different algorithms which is, um, which is solving this. So one thing is to find out um, either by trial and error on your data uh, whether this is going to work or not. Or there might be someone who has already tried on a specific set of data. And if you think that yours is very similar to that, then you could uh, take things from their learnings, uh, probably use their model for transfer learning, and start from there instead of starting from scratch. Um, once you get to a level, then you can add some custom layers and start to build on the architecture, which is already well established, and uh, b build your customization uh, to fit your use case. So that's how I would go about it. Yes. Every project has machine learning. If you if you got to do a do over on this, yeah. What would you What would you do differently? Okay. Um, so this project, um, um, the main uh, skill that I think I lacked was. Uh, GIS uh, experience. So what uh, what I wanted to do is be able to say um, the latitude and longitudes which are enclosing this particular runway. And uh, so I wanted to georeference the image and be able to say at any particular point if a flight's located here, uh, then I'd be able to say uh, this is how long it would take for a flight to move from here to here because we have these geocoordinates already located. So in terms of uh, um, um, the model architecture itself, I think there's a lot more that we could try, but time's a constraint. So uh, start with something which works the best and then work your way through that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's what I. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I actually have that, but yeah, I was not really sure what kind of uh, crowd that we we're expecting, so didn't go into too much of technical detail. Sorry about that. I would say a little bit of both. <laughs> um, being a subject matter expert in the area kind of helps you get uh, domain understanding. Um, but not having knowledge in the area also helps you uh, think very, very differently than what an expert in that area would do. So a combination of both, or if you have a team uh, which is kind of a balance, it kind of helps you bring in a collection of ideas which might be relevant. Um, uh, kind of, sort of. <laughs> so in terms of modeling perspective, I have already thought through the path on uh, what more I could have tried, what I've not done before. Uh, but in, yeah. 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 So um, I think mostly the business model here with us is um, we do the development of the model, mostly POCs. And then uh, when it go goes to the deployment level, there's some Im amount of involvement depending on the company, uh, whether they are interested to have us involved 
um, when it's going through a transition with the software teams um, in tool development, but I don't think we do um, enterprise support for their tools. I'm correct, right? excited to have her working with our software development to help educate them, but they've been doing this stuff for a while. We're, we're, we're structured around that. Now, it's a different situation if we're handing off to uh, what I would call a traditional software development team at a customer that may not have any idea when you talk about a deep learning model and training on GPUs, and that's a more involved process where we can advise on that. We're not expert in helping people actually build up that skill set in-house, but we would be talk having that conversation that you're talking about with a customer like that before we even start on the POC and make sure that we understand, is this something you are going to be able to take over and support, or is this something that you need us to just run and own, and anytime you need a new set of these, you come to us and say, hey, can you charge through another 25 Air Force for uh, But that starts way up front in those situations. We don't wait until this point. Yeah. Yeah, but the last set of images that I showed is not um, anywhere in North America. So you tried to test the model. Yeah. 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 Um, on my training data, so I had um, forty-six images uh, in total, uh, which was split between uh, forty images, forty-one images on training, and five images uh, kept separate for testing with ground truth. Uh, so these 41 images, I translated them to 500 and then did a test while a uh, train validation of 8020 and uh, did my training. Did I answer your question? Okay. Um, I guess. <laughs> sure. Uh, do I work with? Uh, so this particular project, we were um, using Collab, but yeah, I do. Uh, no. You did image classification on no GPU? On Collab. But using a Collab GPU? Yeah, uh, GPU. GPU. But I don't have to configure anything, so that's what I mentioned. So you can just import all your libraries and get started right there. You don't have to uh, build your virtual environment, um, which is, you don't have to worry about the compatibility. Yeah, yeah. So since this was still a POC, we didn't uh, think much further, but just wanted to see what results we can get immediately. So uh, that was the target over here. <laughs> yeah, we did think about that before uh, using it because this was already public data. So uh, we decided to go with it. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think we'll, we'll, we'll break, but that's not to say, <laughs> you know, leave. The best part is after the talks, right? So yeah. I think what we normally do, we send our speakers to different corners so that we can have smaller conversations with them. So let's keep the conversation awesome. going. And, uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you.